I'm Sarah, a 40-year-old mother of two, wedded to my rock, John, for almost two decades. Our life's been a thrilling yet challenging journey, and it's the companionship in these times that truly counts. However, things took a turn with the unexpected arrival of my younger brother Tom, a 32-year-old who's still figuring life out, often making impulsive decisions. It was a typical Sunday, with our family congregating at Mom's house, a place brimming with childhood nostalgia. As we were savoring Mom's delightful roast and her tales, Tom barged in, unexpectedly accompanied by a young, pregnant woman named Lisa, his fiancée. This sudden revelation, amidst a peaceful family lunch, caught everyone off guard. Lisa, youthful and visibly pregnant, was dressed more for a party than a family gathering. This news stunned everyone, especially my kids, Emily and Max, who were curious and bewildered by their new aunt-to-be and her sparkling attire. Tom's announcement of his engagement and impending fatherhood brought a tense silence to the room. Only broken by John's attempt at congratulatory words, Tom declared their plan to stay at Mom's temporarily, which visibly worried her. It was like observing someone unwittingly edge closer to a precipice. That night, John and I discussed the situation. He expressed his concern about Tom's irresponsible behavior and the strain it was putting on my mother. The following days were chaotic, with Tom and Lisa overstepping boundaries. While Mom tirelessly catered to their needs, visibly worn down by their lack of gratitude. One evening, I found Mom in the kitchen, her fatigue evident. I urged her to stand up for herself, but her maternal instincts towards Tom and his unborn child made it impossible for her to turn them away. I felt an overwhelming urge to confront them, to expose their exploitation of mom's kindness, but I restrained myself. In family dynamics, love often means overlooking the obvious faults, even when it's detrimental. This became our new reality, Tom and Lisa, the inconsiderate house guests, and the rest of us tiptoeing around to maintain harmony in a home that now seemed constricting. Our days were upended by Tom and Lisa's presence. Each morning was greeted with Lisa's loud grievances about her discomforts or cravings. She'd saunter into the kitchen, still in her nightwear, demanding breakfast without a hint of courtesy. Sarah, whip up some pancakes, would you? The baby's craving them, she'd order without a please. I'd clench my teeth, trying to maintain composure. Sure, Lisa. Just after I prepare Emily and Max for school. Tom was equally unhelpful, idly lounging, his attention fixed on his laptop or video games, occasionally shouting for food without a glance our way. Mom attempted to mediate, reminding me they were young, but I couldn't overlook their blatant sense of entitlement. As Lissa's due date neared, the situation worsened. She left clutter everywhere, engaged in endless phone gossip, while dishes and laundry piled up. One day, I reached my breaking point. Finding her in the living room, feet propped on the coffee table, I confronted her. Lisa, this is in the hotel. You can't just expect everyone to clean up after you. Her response was a dismissive eye roll. Chill, Sarah. I'm pregnant, remember? Tom's defense was swift but infuriating. Lay off her, Sarah. She's carrying my child. Mom intervened, pleading for peace, but the unfairness was glaring. She was exhausting herself for their sake, yet remained unheeded. They treated our home like a free-for-all, leaving messes and responsibilities for mom, and even had the audacity to plan an extravagant wedding, expecting mom to foot the bill. Their disregard for mom's well-being became intolerable. Even after the birth of their son Alex, their behavior didn't change. One morning, I walked in to find mom tackling a pile of dirty dishes, while Lisa idly watched TV and Tom was absorbed in his phone. I asked Mom why she was burdened with all the work, but the answer was all too familiar. The cycle of disregard and exploitation seemed endless, leaving me grappling with frustration and concern for my overburdened mother. I questioned Mom, trying to maintain composure, but her response only added to my frustration. Lisa needs to rest, and Tom. Well, Tom's busy, she said. Turning to Lisa, I pointed out her lack of contribution, 
but she retorted with the excuse of her recent childbirth. Tom, disengaged as ever, defended her, claiming ignorance of their hardships. I was incredulous at their audacity. Sitting idle and burdening mom was their idea of being busy? Mom attempted to diffuse the tension, claiming she didn't mind the extra work, but my patience had worn thin. I'd argue that mom was not their servant, but my words fell on deaf ears. Tom and Lisa continued their routine, frequently leaving the house, burdening mom with their child, and flaunting their extravagant purchases. Discovering a receipt for an expensive dress, I confronted them about the financial burden they were placing on mom. Tom's indifferent shrug and Lisa's smug attitude were infuriating. They saw nothing wrong in exploiting mom's generosity. Alone with mom, I pleaded with her to see the situation for what it was, exploitation. But her maternal instincts blinded her to their irresponsibility. I can't abandon them, especially not Alex, she said. Despite my efforts to persuade her, she remained steadfast in her belief that they needed her help. Feeling helpless, I watched the family dynamic deteriorate. Tom and Lisa continued their parasitic behavior, while Mom, ever the selfless mother, couldn't recognize the extent of their exploitation. The situation reached a breaking point when Mom suddenly fell ill. One day, she was her usual self. The next, she was bedridden and weak. I stayed by her side offering hopeful words, but inside, I felt a growing anger towards Tom and Lisa, who were conspicuously absent, likely squandering more of Mom's resources. I expressed my outrage, but Mom's response was tinged with sadness. They have their own lives, Sarah, she said, her voice weary. Her condition worsened, and eventually, Mom passed away, quietly, in the night. I was there, but Tom and Lisa were absent likely enjoying themselves, oblivious to our family's loss. The funeral was a blur, a mixture of grief and resentment towards my absent brother and his partner. Their absence during mom's final moments and their continued disregard weighed heavily on me, underscoring the profound disconnection within our family. I recall the moment Tom and Lisa arrived at the funeral, their appearance more fitting for a celebration than a solemn occasion. Lissa's attire was notably inappropriate, drawing murmurs from the crowd. John offered me a comforting squeeze of the hand, trying to provide some support. Post-service, Tom urgently wanted to discuss Mom's will. His insistence, so soon after our loss, left me aghast. He claimed Mom had left the house to him, a statement that seemed incredibly presumptuous and insensitive given the circumstances. My protests about respecting mom's memory fell on deaf ears. Tom was adamant about his entitlement. The following day, I visited mom's house to gather her belongings, but I was met by Lissa's sneering face at the door. She coldly informed me that the house was now theirs, claiming Tom had inherited everything. Tom's appearance, confirming the claim with a smug grin, sparked a mixture of anger and disbelief in me. I felt alienated, standing at the threshold of my childhood home, now claimed by my callous brother and his wife. Determined to seek justice, I found myself nervously entering the notary's office. The whole ordeal, grappling with Mum's loss, and now this dispute with Tom, seemed like a nightmare. Mr. Jacobs, the notary and an old family friend, greeted me with a solemn expression. As I voiced my doubts about Tom's claim, Tom and Lisa arrived, exuding arrogance. Mr. Jacobs began reading the will, and my anxiety peaked. When he reached the part about Tom, he announced a bequest of only $5,000 to him, a revelation that visibly shocked Tom. Mr. Jacobs then continued, to my relief and surprise, declaring that Mom had left the family home and the remainder of her estate to me. This unexpected turn of events was a small solace in the midst of our family strife offering a glimmer of hope amidst the grief and turmoil that had enveloped us since Mom's passing. The revelation in Mr. Jacob's office left me feeling a mix of relief and vindication. Lissa, on the other hand, was incensed, incredulous at the idea that they weren't left the house. Mr. Jacobs informed us that Mom had made this last will only a month ago due to her concerns about being pressured by certain family members. Tom's reaction was one of rage and denial, 
but there was a sense of justice in the air. Mom had seen through their exploitation. Tom accused me of turning Mom against him, while Lissa threatened legal action. Mr. Jacobs warned them about the possible legal repercussions if coercion was proven in any earlier will. Their confidence seemed to falter at this. As Tom and Lisa left the notary's office in a huff, I stayed behind to express my gratitude to Mr. Jacobs. I left feeling a whirlwind of emotions, sorrow for losing Mom, relief that her final wishes were honored, and anger at Tom and Lisa's audacity. Back at the house, Tom confronted me, infuriated by the disparity in our inheritance. I tried to explain that this was Mom's decision, likely influenced by their continuous financial demands. His frustration was palpable as he demanded to know why Mom would screw him over like this. Then I found Mom's letter, tucked away in a drawer. It explained everything. Mom had initially set aside an equal share for both of us, but as Tom and Lisa's demands increased, she began to deduct from his portion. By the time she wrote her last will, Tom had already received most of his share through these advances. Tom was shocked and in denial, unable to accept that his actions had led to this outcome. I was firm, my patience thinning, as I confronted him with the reality of the situation. He sat, overwhelmed by his own actions, pondering the gravity of what he had done. The weight of his choices and their impact on Mom's final decisions was a harsh reality he now had to face. As I set the letter down, a blend of pity and frustration washed over me. You've only yourself to blame, Tom. This was your doing, I said, watching him leave the house, a shadow of the man he once was. There was a sense of justice in his departure, but it was tinged with sadness for a family now fractured by both grief and selfishness. The house, previously a battleground of family conflicts, now stood in a haunting silence. Tom and Lisa had left, severing all ties with me. It was a relief to be freed from their tumult, yet it also left me to grapple with the fallout of their actions. As I sat in the living room, lost in thought, my phone rang. It was Jenna, bringing news of Tom. He was job hunting in town, and Lisa seemed to be living a single life, with no sign of their son, Alex. Anger surged within me at their reckless disregard for their child. Jenna's voice broke through my fury, suggesting that maybe there was something I could do. Her words ignited a spark of determination in me. I had to fight for Alex. He deserved a better life. The next day, I met with a lawyer, Ms. Rivera, a straightforward and determined woman. I laid out my case, my resolve firm. I want to pursue custody of Alex. He's in a toxic environment, I told her. Ms. Rivera, sizing up the situation, agreed to help, though she warned it wouldn't be easy. The ensuing legal battle was arduous, with Tom and Lisa oscillating between cooperation and hostility but I remained steadfast. John's support was unwavering, his arms a haven of comfort after each challenging day in court. You're doing the right thing, Sarah. It's hard but necessary, he reassured me. The day I was granted temporary custody of Alex was filled with mixed emotions. He was a sweet, bewildered boy, but gradually he began to adapt to our family. Emily and Max quickly grew fond of him, and he brought a new joy into our home. Tom's reaction was one of anger and resignation. You've taken everything, Sarah, he accused. I stood firm, knowing I was protecting Alex, a responsibility Tom had neglected. As Tom walked away, I realized our relationship might never recover, that this was about Alex's well-being, not our sibling rivalry. With Alex, life took on a new dimension. There were challenges, of course, but also moments of laughter and love. He was slowly becoming a part of our family, and I was resolute in making his presence permanent. Looking back, I knew despite the hardships and challenges, we were building a brighter future, one filled with hope and the love of a family reunited under new circumstances. Making the decision to bring Alex into our family was undeniably the right choice. It marked a new chapter for us, an opportunity to heal, grow, and foster a future brimming with love and stability. This was the legacy I yearned to create, a vivid departure from the selfishness and discord that once loomed over us.
Our home, once a symbol of family strife, was now alive with laughter and the joyful sounds of children. Alex had seamlessly integrated into our lives, his presence a beacon of happiness. One evening, as I tucked him into bed, his innocent question about staying with us forever warmed my heart. Yes, Alex, you're part of our family now, I assured him, and his contented smile was all the confirmation I needed. John, standing by the door, shared a look of pride and fulfillment. He's really fitting in, he observed, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of achievement. We were providing Alex with the life he deserved. The next day brought the exhilarating news. The court had granted me full custody of Alex. Overwhelmed with emotion, I thanked Miss Rivera profusely. The family's reaction to the news was a beautiful sight. Emily and Max embraced Alex, and even John was visibly moved. We're a complete family now, he said, voice laden with emotion. The journey had been tumultuous, but it strengthened us. While I occasionally thought of Tom and Lisa, hoping they would find their path, my priority was our children and our family. In the following months, Alex flourished, transforming from a timid child into one filled with confidence and joy. One day, while playing in the garden, he presented me with a dandelion, proudly announcing his wish for us to be together forever. Holding him close, I assured him that his wish had indeed come true. Looking around at my family, I felt an overwhelming sense of peace. We had navigated through the storm and emerged more robust. Our future was a canvas of hope, love, and endless possibilities. This was our story, a testament to the resilience of family and the transformative power of love. It was a future bright with promise, and we were more than ready to embrace it wholeheartedly.